Working with Vortex-based mathematics. And happy to introduce to you Mr. Randy Powell. I hope I don't ruin it for you guys, but you know, you probably were thinking after the last talk that doing Vortex math makes you good looking. But uh, it doesn't always work out that way. So sorry. Um, okay. So I like to always begin uh, before I say anything about myself and what I do and what I've done by giving recognition to uh, my teacher, Marco Rodin. Who, uh, without whom I definitely wouldn't be here and probably half the people here wouldn't, wouldn't be here in, in one way or another uh, without his tremendous sacrifice and all the hard work he did. He discovered the equation that I'm going to talk about, uh, gosh, nearly 40, about 40 years ago. So you can imagine uh, it's been a, a real long road for him. I've been in this probably seven years and uh, and I'm pretty beat down by it too, <laughs> but uh, I'm uh, I'm very thankful and, and, and appreciative for him and for all his work and and you know a lot of people recognize what I've done and recognize me, but uh, but the truth is I, I really owe it to him and and uh, and everything he's done and a lot of other people too. This our project is a very community project. Uh, people like uh, my good friend Tyler Thurman, who's done so much video work. Uh, DJ White, who did this great animation. You know, uh, people doing applications like Daniel and Erica and Russ Grease, who's here, and, and a whole lot of other people who aren't here. So it goes way beyond me and anything that uh, I've done. I'm glad to just play a role and be a part of it. So that out of the way, now I'm going to talk about what it is that we do and what we've done um, and what we hope to keep evolving and continue with. So uh, this is an animation uh, to demonstrate property of, of an equation that was developed by Marco um, when he, he discovered it when he was about 16 or 17, I believe he's 58 now. Um, so he decrypted, uh, this is a little obscure, so I hope you don't mind, but I, I like to, to go to the obscure too, as well as the concrete, because they're all interrelated. He decrypted what's called the Most Great Name of God, in the Baha'i Faith, which he is a, a member of. And I actually intercepted with his work because of my interest in linguistics and my interest in the, in the mathematics of language. And so Marco had that same interest as a, as a, a young man, and he decrypted the equation for this name, which is said in no uncertain terms, if you ever read the writings of Baha'u'llah, who was, who was the prophet of that faith, and, and in no uncertain terms, he, he says that if you understand this word, if you understand the mathematics of this word, that it will give you the secret to every science, that uh, it will give you the secret to an energy with which, and this was in the early 1800s when he was saying this, he said, uh, you can tap into an energy that requires no fuel and produces no fumes. Um, and essentially, Marco came up with this equation because he wanted to figure out how to pronounce the name correctly, how to actually intonate and say the name. And his reason for being interested in that is because he believed that it's actually the sounds, the language that we speak, and the sounds that we make that create our intelligence. And so he believed that this making the sound in the correct way would be the secret of intelligence, and it would give him the answers to understanding uh, the secret hidden protected energy of, of the universe. And so he developed this equation. Now let me go forward past the animation a little bit. Here you can see it with the numbers. Now this word, if you add all the numbers together, the equation for the word is 1251. I'm going to say a lot of things today that you're not going to retain it, it's okay. Don't try to understand it because that will make it harder. You just listen to it and then of course we're taping all this so you can go back over it. But I'm going to talk a little fast because the time is limited. <coughs> Normally I go in and try to explain the math. I'm not going to do much of that today because it uh, just gets a little complex. But you can see the simple aspect. 
like many of our great mathematical equations over the ages, this is simply a cross-section of a circle, like pi or, or, or many others. It has nine points on it, because one, two, five, one, if you add them together, they equal nine. And it, it was said that nine was what represented this energy. So Marco put nine at the top, and he drew the numbers around the circle. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Right, according to the right hand. And he knew, because of the way that the equation was, I won't go into the linguistic argument for why this is, but he knew that the 2 and the 5 were connected to the 1. So what he did is he drew a line from the 1 to the 2, and from the 1 to the 5. And every other line that you see here is simply a parallel line to one of those lines. So if you take that line from 1 to 2, you've got 9 to 3, 8 to 4, 7 to 5, and then you end on 6. You take the line from 1 to 5, you have 8 to 7, 9 to 6, of course, the one to five, two to four, and you end on three. So all this is is simply two sets of parallel lines. Okay? And when, when you see it, immediately you realize, well, even without the coloring, which has been added in, you realize that there's, there's two separate intersecting systems here. One is this, what they call the lazy eight, or the infinity symbol, or you could call it the VW. All right, everybody's familiar with that. A lot of hippies here, I know. Um, uh, so uh, that circuit is essentially it's a waveform. That's what it is. It's modeling a closed loop. It has no beginning or end. It, it, it started anywhere and ended anywhere. It's simply a closed loop. It's continuous. And what that, uh, what we came to learn about that many many years later, is that this sequence of numbers represents the physical world of matter in motion, 3D space, okay? Uh, somebody asked me the other day, well, what is matter? What is mass? And we could go into lots of different thoughts about that, but essentially it's a boundary condition. Okay? It's a dividing line between one thing and another. And it always has a center, which is what this is. And this is the zero point right here, but we'll come back to that. So if you follow this sequence, just to give you a little brief on the math, it makes a doubling pattern. One doubled is two, two doubled is four, four doubled is eight. Eight doubled, well that's not seven, but eight doubled is 16, so why do we have seven? Well, we're simply doing the age old numerological, or if you want to be techno about it, you can call it digital root math, or decimal parity, or whatever. Um, if you want to be new age, you can call it numerology. Uh, you add the numbers together, it's called cross addition. Six and one is seven. Right? 16 doubled is 32, 3 plus 2 is 5, 32 doubled then is 64, 6 and 4 is 10, and 1 and 0 is 1. I'm just going to say this quickly, 64 doubles 128, which comes back to equal 2, 256, which equals 4, 512, which equals 8. In other words, you can do that forever, and it will never break that pattern. 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5, 1, 2, 4, 8, 7, 5. It means the doubling, which underlies so many uh, processes not only in, in mathematics, but in physics, chain reactions, our, our, our cells double at conception, which is how we've all come to be here. So it doesn't really get any more intimate or personal than that. Every single one of you came here today through a doubling process. Okay? Interestingly though, you could say, well, is it doubling or is it halving? I don't know, is it dividing, is it multiplying? The truth is, all the functions of math are really one and the same. I'll give you an example. If you, take, if you start with the one, half of one is 0.5, right? Half of 0.5 is 0.25, which equals 7. Half of 0.25 is 0.125, which equals 8, etc. You can do that forever, and it will never stop. Because it's all one and the same. It's a closed loop circuit. It's because infinity in our physical world of mass is not in a straight line. Okay? Neither time or space or anything in the physical world moves in a straight line. It's all warp and a curve, right? And this intersects with a lot of other theories like relativity and people may have their different thoughts about that. But essentially, this is defining a pathway for matter in motion, the path of least resistance. And numerically, that's defined by doubling. Okay, so that's one aspect of what this equation is. It's defining a doubling sequence. Now, then we have this 396. What's the 396? Well, if you look into studying physics, you know, there's really only two things you can study, right? If you look up the definition of physics, it's defined as the study of matter in motion. Of course, then what is putting matter in motion? What is causing the matter to move? 
what is the source of time, motion, and vibration? And that's where you get to the number nine, okay? But before I go to the number nine, I want to talk about three and six. Well, what are three and six, okay? Three and six represent the absolute extremes. They end in the middle of nowhere, and as an engineer friend of ours says, nothing mechanical does that, okay? Everything mechanical connects to something else. Uh, nothing mechanical ends in the middle of nowhere. The three and the six do that. Interestingly, three doubled, if you double three, uh, following the same process, is six. Six doubled is 12, two and one is three. 12 doubled is 24, which equals six. 24 doubled is 48, which equals three, right? They oscillate back and forth. Now the only thing that we know that oscillates is magnetism. And that is really essentially what this is defining. The other aspect of physics, other than matter and motion, are what we call fields, which are a lot more mysterious, you know, they have these properties like non-locality, perhaps. Um, they, they seem to, in many ways, defy a lot of the boundaries we've set around what matter can actually do. Fields seem to be, um, to have uh, different properties. And so, and the nine, what the nine is, is a flux. We call it the etheron, okay? We've uh, postulated that as an ultimate fundamental particle called the etheron. Why do we call it the etheron? Well, traditionally, you know, up until the michelson morley experiment, which many people contest anyway, where they tried to measure the drag of the Earth through space, and they found there was no resistance, so they said, well, there's no need to postulate an ether. All our grandparents and great-grandparents and, and so on and so forth, they all believed in what they called the luminiferous ether, which was supposed to be this substrate of energy distributed throughout the universe. Some people have referred to it as a loquacious jello. Uh, which I don't know what that means really, but uh, anyway, uh, a loquacious jello. Well, it's not a jello, it's not a media. What it is is a pulse, it's a surge. It moves from the center of mass outwards in all directions. And it is characterized by the fact that it's linear. And if you look at this pyramid shape, this triangle, that's what it is. It's a vector. Okay? It is, it is the linear geome geometric structure which is underlying the warp and curve of space and time, which is not linear, as I said before. So it is not a static or stationary ether. It's a pulse. It sets the pace for everything else and it is the fastest thing in the universe. Very uh, similar to a lot of the descriptions that were given this morning um, by a gentleman who was, who was talking here about uh, neutral magnetic fields. Same thing, it penetrates everything. Nothing can resist it, um, and uh, there's so many things. It has every attribute that you can imagine. And the interesting thing about the number nine is, no matter what you do to it, if you multiply the number nine, for instance, uh, 9 times 2 is 18, 9 times 3 is 27. All the numbers always equal 9. It's the never-changing number 9. And it's the only number that has that characteristic. Now, if you happen to be a mathematician, you might make a, uh, an argument with me about different base systems. And if you are a mathematician, we can get into that after. I'm not going to melt everybody's head with that uh, you know, crap. So, uh, so what we're claiming is totally the opposite and reverse of everything that's taught in the university. I'll give you a couple examples. And, and if you go to university, if you study mathematics, they say, well, base systems are arbitrary. You can count according to any system. You could use base 15, you could use base 5, you could use base 100. It doesn't really matter. Um, we, they say we use base 10 because we have 10 fingers. Actually, we don't even have 10 fingers. Can you believe that? What we have is 0.5, which is half of 100%, and they're mirror images based on an axis. Okay, it's all optical illusions. If we had 10 fingers, your thumb would be on the other side, or on this side, right? But because they're mirror images, they're, that's not how you actually look at it. So that's a process of halving. Okay, the number nine is forming an axis. It's the only thing that aligns with the zero, which is the hole at the center of the donut, as uh, Daniel and Erica were demonstrating before. All right, and I'm going to get to the shape and how we came to it, because this is my little baby. Okay, um, so Marco developed this equation. He started to notice a lot of interesting properties about it. Here you can see another picture of the animation showing how it moves. If I was to go back, then you can get a sense of what's going on here now. You've got a pulse moving out, expansion and contraction, and this here is defining in two dimensions the vortex, okay? Here, uh, I'm not gonna go over these numbers. You, you know, I've got tons of videos online and you can look up all this stuff. 
but essentially it's just showing how the regular rule of multiplication tables that we learned as kids could be the division tables as well, or addition or subtraction. Because vortex-based mathematics is the unification of all the functions of math. We're doing every function of math possible instantaneously, times divide plus and minus. Okay? But what you see here is that everything on opposite sides of the nine forms bilateral symmetry. Okay? I'll just do one example. If you do multiples of 1, it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Of course, 10 reduces to 1, 11 to 2, 12 to 3, and so on. Now you say, well, 8's not a mirror of 1. Well, we do notice that 1 and 8 equal 9, if you add them together, as well as 2 and 7, 4 and 5, always equal 9, as well as 3 and 6. Okay? Um, 8, if 1 is going up in multiples of 1, that means 8's going to go down in, in, in groups of 1. So 8 times 2 is 16, 6 and 1 is 7. 8 times 3 is 24, which equals 6, 32, which equals 5, 40, which is 4, and so on. That works for every multiplication series. That's because numbers are not flat. They're not dead. They're not inert. Numbers are real. So when you go to school and they teach you that base systems are arbitrary, or that numbers are arbitrary conventions made up by human beings, that's false. We're saying that numbers are real. And what does that mean? That means that numbers aren't modeling geometry, numbers are geometry. Numbers are geometric. They define space and time literally. Okay? So this is showing how we start to get symmetry. Okay? Uh, I threw this in there because this is a very clear example of where you can see this shape, this lazy eight or this VW. Uh, again, doesn't get more intimate than your very own DNA which you'll see right pictures of DNA and wrong pictures of DNA. The wrong pictures of DNA are perfectly symmetrical, which is not how it actually is. It's actually offset. Okay, and you can see that shape right there. One, two, four, eight, seven, five. Because this is the secret of why your DNA is in a double helic, helical spiral, and it's also the secret to the missing component that the geneticists haven't fully identified yet, though they kind of know it's there, which is that in this gap space here, which is called the major groove in genetics, is a, a flux field, a magnetic field. And that field, which they do know is there, their explanation is that DNA is made up of phosphates which have a negative electric charge and an associated magnetic field. But the truth is, that magnetic field is controlling, switching the expression of the genes. And I believe it's a conscious field. Okay. Here it gets more into the quantum level of the work we've done on DNA. I won't go through that too much. But here in the red is where you can see this 396. Uh, and that, by the way, we have no idea. Marco had no idea that there was a magnetic field in the major group of DNA. He simply predicted it mathematically, and he contacted the experts in the field, and they confirmed it. So um, that was a successful prediction made by the math. This is the next step uh, that happened, and I'm talking you through things that have happened over many, many years. This is where the numbers become quantized, or we take it to the quantum, the discrete level. And now, what this is, uh, it's been referred to by a lot of names. Uh, Marco likes to call it the mathematical fingerprint of God. Um, you know, you can, you can call it what you want. Uh, but essentially, it is now starting to give the numbers of shape. I should mention there are three shapes really that are specifically defined in this map um, and they're pretty easy, okay? The, the three, does anybody have a guess? Triangle. All right, I get it. Too. The six. Hexagon. Hexagon, all right. If you didn't get that one. All right. And the nine, a little bit more difficult, but you can see it right here between the zero and the nine, is a diamond. Okay? It just so happens that those are the only shapes that by themselves you can fully map and tile a 3D surface topology without any breaks. Okay? And, and that's very significant. So, when coming up with this, what we call the diamond grain crystal lattice structure, which is seen in, in a lot of uh, natural things, and I'll show you some images here in a few minutes. Um, this map contains every mathematical function possible. Now, I said function, and this is another place where VBM, or vortex-based mathematics, I'll say VBM from now on, you know what it is. Um, this is a place, another place where VBM is a total 180 mirror image of conventional mathematics. Because 
In conventional mathematics, you have functions. The functions are held still. They're the placeholders, right? And the numbers move. They change. The truth is, numbers don't ever change. They're fixed, and they're fixed in relationship to one another. They are what we call stationary vector interstices, which is just a real nerdy way of saying that they're nodal points. Because every wave has to have a point where it stops going up and starts going down, or stops going left and starts going right. For, in order for something to curve, there have to be those nodal points there, and that is essentially what the numbers are defined. If you look at that equation, at each nodal point is a number. The numbers are still, and the functions move through the numbers, okay? Which is actually more what a function is. It's a movement, it's an activity. And so, you can actually model every principle of physics, every type of waveform can be done here. And what this is showing is that it's a positive and negative dual coordinate system, uh, which means that on every axis, x, y, and z, even though you can't see the z-axis, here, you can see the x-axis vertical, you can see the y-axis horizontal, okay? They each are defined by a different multiplication series, and you can always see that you have doubling at an angle, flowing at an angle, which is how things move at an angle. Nothing moves perfectly left or right, up or down. Everything moves at an angle along that pathway, from positive to negative, positive to negative, positive to negative, okay? Um, the z-axis, the reason that you can't see it here, is because it's coming from the inside out. This etheron energy moves from the center of mass. doesn't matter if it's an atom, or, or a galaxy, or the whole universe itself, which I believe is in the shape of a torus, which is what we're going to get to next. It moves from the center of mass out in all directions linearly, as I said before. And so you, you're, you're not seeing it as an x or y axis, and it took, I guess, uh, over 30 years before I really came along and, and actually figured out how to calculate this in a 3D and take it out of this. When you do it, you get this shape. I love so much. <laughs> and she's very beautiful. Uh, because here, we're now warping the axes to be circular. And this is the first mathematics, okay? I'll give you a, a place why this is significant. Uh, for instance, there's uh, something postulated in physics called black holes, you are all familiar with that. Uh, which is postulated to be an infinitely dense, they don't even know what it is because it doesn't even make any sense. What is infinite density? Uh, and there's so much debate about it and you can read endless uh, heady books about it. But um, the reason is, the reason that uh, the black holes thought to be infinite, and they don't really know what's happening to the information or to the matter. You know, Stephen Hawking and uh, what's like Susskind had a big famous debate about what happens to the information. Well, the truth is, what happens is it comes out the other side, because calculus is unable to go through the center of the donut and invert on its axis and come out the other side. It's unable to do that. It self-destructs. It just goes to infinity. But BBM is the first mathematics that's been able to do that, to actually model a full 3D that can implode at the top, as we were referring to in the last talk about the magnetic fields collapsing at the top, and to explode at the bottom. So if the Big Bang is in fact true, it would just simply be one of these explosions coming out the bottom. When it comes out the bottom, it expands and cools off, which is what's happening in the universe right now as we are perceiving it because I believe we're on the southern half of the universe, eventually it will warp up because it is displaced, moved by this etheron energy, by the magnetic fields, and cooled off. And then eventually it will collapse in at the top. It will be accelerated. It will be heated. And eventually it will be condensed to an extreme density. Now, when we talk about all, all of these devices tapping into all this energy, we're always referring to sound. And I got into this because of my interest in sound, because I'm a musician, and, and many of us are, and because I knew that sound was really behind uh, the ge geometry of nature. It was the force that's, that's symmetrizing everything. Now, conventionally, it's taught that the fastest thing traveling in the universe is light through the vacuum of space. Um, and what I believe is actually, when you go, and, and, and some other scientists have postulated this as well, um, when you go into the density, exotic density of matter, where it's being compressed to the point 
that the escape velocity of light is no longer fast enough to escape that matter, which is why it's called a black hole, that sound, which has the complete opposite property, right? Light slows down in media, uh, sound travels faster the more dense the media is. So sound penetrating matter near the core of a black hole, I believe, is actually transcending the speed of light. And it creates what's called a quasi-particle, is what they refer to it in quantum mechanics as. Uh, a quasi-mass particle, I believe, is how they refer to it. Uh, some people call it hypersound. All right? And that is where that energy is emitted from. It's literally wrung out of the matter, like squeezing the juice out of an orange. Okay? Um, and, and then it redistributes itself. It reanimates everything. It re-enlivens, recreates. Okay? It is the anti-entropic force. It is the organizing principle. Okay, here's some more pictures of this Taurus. Uh, you wouldn't believe, I know it looks, you wouldn't believe uh, what it took to, to actually do this because now we're so fortunate. This is an image done by my friend Tom Barnett. The last one was done by a friend of mine, Scott Graham. I never had any of these computers or anything. I had to do this on my head. And uh, it, it really was kind of a, a feat uh, in the sense that I'm lucky that I didn't die trying to do it. <laughs> but uh, um, my head didn't explode or something. Uh, but it, this is showing actually the southern half, which is decompressing out the bottom. Okay, so that would be your your big bang. Here's another one. You can scale this up and down to infinity, which is what makes it fractal. Numbers themselves are a fractal, a 3D fractal. So you can look at simpler versions. This is the most basic model right here, right? It, it, or you can scale it. You can divide it to infinity. But you never reach the zero, because the zero is the whole. You never, this is why absolute zero, I don't believe, really exists. Because you're always decreasing in partial increments from your initial whole. So you can go colder and colder and colder and colder, right? But eventually, and, and this was actually proven recently where they um, were showing how there was a, uh, they, they thought that they went beyond absolute zero and then showed that there was an anti-entropic force present. I don't know if anybody else read about that, but it was, uh, it was talked about in, in the universities and everything. This shape, the torus, which comes out of uh, that equation, I believe is the ultimate fundamental shape for energy transformation, and that's what these coils are based on. Though we still have so much to learn, not only about what kind of media to use in order to harness this, and, and, and copper wire is just you know, a, a, a primitive first step, not knocking anybody's work. Their work is absolutely excellent and, uh, and provides so much. You know, most people would think I was totally insane if it wasn't for people like Daniel and, and Erica who are uh, showing proof of concept that, because there's nothing about electrical engineering that says the geometry of the wire would affect the output at all. Certainly not double it with no core and, and half the material. You know, it, it's insane. I mean, what, all this, you know, I, I'm not an engineer, thank God. But, uh, so that energy is coming from the inside out and it creates this lattice structure as it penetrates the matter. And that creates the pathway of least resistance, as they said before. I'll show you some examples here. This is actually out of a medical journal. It took me a while to find this. Luckily now, somebody must have gotten this off me because uh, now if you search uh, my name or like Alpha Taurus on Google, you can actually find this image. It took me years to find it. It was out of a medical journal. And these are actually images of DNA taking the shape of a torus. Okay, so it doesn't just end in the middle of nowhere. Um, in fact, it, DNA even can warp and curve back into itself and create this toroidal shape because it is the way that it's transforming energy. Here's an image of blood cells. Again, the toroidal shape. Uh, this is a cavitation bubble uh, where they've measured, uh, if you read the journal articles, which were up on my website, I don't have a website up at the moment. Um, that's extreme lack of funding. Uh, I didn't have the seven dollars a month or whatever it costs. Inside that jet, that hole, that zero point, has been measured up to 5,000 degrees Celsius, okay, which is like the surface of the sun, and it's cool on the outside, right? That is the core principle that unifies our problem and solution to every single technology out there, which is temperature regulation. 
fact, if we don't have temperature regulation, we die very quickly, okay, or we burn up. The same thing is true for the planet, the same thing is true for the galaxy, for everything. The torus is how temperature is regulated. It concentrates all the heat and energy into the center, and then it uses the magnetic fields to redistribute it and cool it down. Okay, now this is something we postulated years ago, and I was fortunate recently that uh, some Japanese scientists confirmed this because they're actually making magnetic refrigerators now. They claim that they actually don't even know how it's working, but when you oscillate magnetic fields, uh, you, can, uh, you can regulate temperature. So that has actually uh, proven to be true. There's one and weather systems we're all familiar with. Uh, there's the galaxy uh, in the shape of a torus. Another one. Okay. There's uh, dolphins uh, who've been observed to use using their uh, sonar, again using the sound, creating these toroidal rings that they then expand, contract, play around with, and just another place where you see it in nature. There's the sunflower, again, utilizing the hexagonal geometry and creating a toroid. Okay, here you can see the toroid, you can see the numbers a little better. There's so many things I could say about this. This was done by my friend Chuck Nida, uh, and you can uh, see here that there are numbers overlaying the other numbers, demonstrating how some of these fractal patterns work. What these numbers over the numbers are actually defining uh, which is the key to harnessing this technology, and I believe this is the part that we really haven't, and somebody was asking me about this earlier, this is the part that we really haven't totally tapped into yet fully. Which I call, uh, Marco originally, I think, coined the term underpinning nested vortices. They're like Coriolis forces, vortexes within vortexes. Uh, a good example are dimples on a golf ball. And if anybody here remembers, I don't really, but if you remember, back in, in the old days when the golf balls used to be smooth. Anybody remember that? The golf balls didn't have dimples on them, they used to be smooth. And then uh, it was some mathematician or scientist based on tetrahedron's thing, they figured out if you put these dimples in it, it would control the flight properties, the lift of, of the golf ball, it would give it better slice, everything like that. And, and, and indeed it would accelerate it, cause it to go higher and further. And, and that is what that principle is. If you can tap into the underpinning nested vortices, they work as accelerators, okay? And that's when you can really start to tap into the etheron, I believe. Um, let's see, what else we got here? More beautiful images of this torus. I wish I had all day to really explain to you the beauty and complexity of what these numbers define, how you can make waveforms that ripple out and make perfect calculations that come back and condense either where they started or on an opposite symmetrical node. Anything like Newton's cradle is an example that you can define uh, with these type of systems. Um, here's another image showing, uh, this is one I hand drew, showing the underpinning S and vortices. Some of them are compressing, some of them are decompressing. And you always have at the center an upright vertical axis. Another way of defining what is mass, it is a frame of reference, if anybody's familiar with that term. It defines the space and time that we're living in, and, and it is the, really the source of, of relativity. And why that is important for why we're here, for energy, and ultimately, uh, you know, one of my interests, big interests, which is travel, for flight. Because this is the secret to vertical axis propulsion, okay? Implode, explode, closed system, and it harnesses the secret of the vertical axis, which goes back to that number nine, which is at the apex of the vector, okay? The etheron is always ascending, which is why we have gravity. It's why matter collapses in on itself, because it's being deflected by the ascending etheron particle. Okay, another uh, showing of one half of the nest of vortices that were different uh, patterns. This gets into a little bit more of the complex side of the base and map. Uh, I don't really have time to define all that for you, but it's showing how different what we call family number groups are interrelating to form very specific geometric shapes. In fact, within these toruses, you can define every single geometry that exists and a whole lot that people are probably unaware of. Um, here is uh, one example of showing, uh, this is again done by Tom Barnett, showing that 
uh, where this pathway of the z-axis, these emanations, are intersecting. And it's a very, it's a very interesting uh, point because you can see this on another torus. I'll show you exactly where that's been observed, which was in the famous uh, Eye of God supernova. You can see that exact same and along those white lines. Pathway. And I had no idea we did this. I mean, I had no idea that it was going to come out into that shape. I simply did the math, created the shape, and uh, you can see that eyeball kind of intersection at the middle. Okay. Those are actually the end of my slides. Um, I didn't, I, I really condensed this down because I knew we were at limited time. And I wanted to introduce these concepts. Ultimately, I believe that if the etheron is understood, tapped into, I'm very interested in transforming these like uh, plasma coils, uh, a little more higher end technology if, if the funding becomes available. Uh, I believe that it, you can tap into literally limitless, inexhaustible energy that is, is truly free, is truly um, at the source of, of even free, free will itself, self-determination, a self-enclosed frame of reference. This is essentially the explanation, as far as I'm concerned, of what the famous flying saucer is why it is in this shape and why it moves like it does. And understanding those nested vortices is the key to how to steer it, how to move it. Okay, so um, I think I'll stop there and let people ask questions and then we can just sort of see where it goes. Sure. You, you mentioned that numbers are a 3D fractal. Could you explain more about that concept? Sure. So. You know, we, we learn about numbers traditionally in multiplication series as if they exist in an abstract realm. We, we learn about three apples and two oranges and, and all that. That is the, uh, what is called numbers as quantity. Okay? And, and, and many people talk about quantity versus quality in all aspects of life. Well, numbers are the same way. They do have quantities, but the quantities of numbers as they express themselves are a an expression or a result of the qualities of numbers. So the quantitative doubling within a system is an expression of the qualitative doubling. And that means that quantitatively, as it's doubling, it's actually moving as well. It's actually creating geometric lattice structures. Um, and so you can't separate mathematics from 3D space. There's lots of different theories in mathematics. You can read about string theory. Uh, you know, I did this TED talk where uh, you know, I was, after some years, kind of sparked this censorship mode of, of TED that they've gone into. Uh, I, I like to... Were you the first? I, as far as I know, myself and uh, there was an economist who was censored by them. Uh, yeah. And uh, we were the first two that uh, I think got it. So, so I, was, I was excited, you know. <laughs> I love confrontation. I'm totally all about it. So I, I went and I said, all right, this is great. I said, let's have a debate. I got, I got them to bring all their people. We got this huge conference call with all the head people from TED, and, and there was all these witnesses there who organized the TED that I spoke at. And man, they had nothing. They couldn't answer a single question, and they, they had no reason for censoring. And why I bring this up is because, one, so one of the things they said, they said, well, we can't put this out there because there's no empirical evidence to support it. Well, I said, actually, and, indeed there is, and now I even have confirmations from universities in Europe who are putting together now a technical manual for us to show that these, even these simple primitive devices are drawing energy from an unknown, unexplainable source. They can't, there's no explanation for where it's coming from. They're also able to do things like produce rare noble gases at extremely low voltages, which is, according to them, very unheard of. Uh, things like argon gas. Uh, the, uh, so I said, well, there is actually empirical evidence, but I'm okay with that. But I said, if, if that's the reason you're censoring me, then you need to take down, all, like, for example, Brian Greene's talk on string theory, because not only is there no empirical evidence, there's not even any way to even get at how you would figure out how to test that. What did right? they say? Well, they said, well, but he's famous. You know? Oh, <laughs> so, you know, hey. He's well known. He teaches <laughs> at a university. I said, well, so is that what it is? I'm not famous enough to say this? <laughs> you know? Um, and that was just one of about a hundred points, and, and I, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that some of my friends uh, quit and left that organization over the um, complete humiliation I was experienced uh, by their uh, uh, close-mindedness. Uh, thank you. Uh, but, um, one last thing. 
who somebody somewhere had to instigate that did they did that ever come out yeah it was a group of science bloggers online and if you read the blogs they sent me the blogs I said well let me read them they sent them to me and there's not one criticism of anything that I said it's a total ad hominem they'll just quote me and go this guy's crazy you know, I was like, that's scientific discourse, you know? Like, wow. I mean, and I told them, I said, let's have a public debate. I'm open. I said, I'll debate anybody. And Rupert Sheldrake did this too. He, he got yeah. censored much later, but, you know, they, they want to engage. Hancock, yeah, they, they want to engage on that level. Yeah. I said, you know, if, if I'm so fallacious, then you should expose me to the public and let's just squash this once and for all. But they didn't, they didn't, they were a little intimidated by that, I guess. Um, um, Sure. Uh, I noticed like everything in the universe is reticular, everything's spinning. Um, Does somebody have a microphone you can give them? Oh yeah, I think there, was there one up here? <laughs> there used to be another one. Oh, here it comes. Here comes the microphone. So we can hear, yeah. There you go. It seems like everything in, in the mature, everything in the universe is spinning, it's reticular. Like the Earth is spinning, the Sun is spinning, the solar system, the galaxy, and that. Who knows about the universe? Is it spinning as well? Um, what's causing it? Um, does every material object have like an in and out, like energy just flowing in through the ether? And it's also, I believe, it's been demonstrated that matter, even a matter, our energy is coming out of matter, like, like photonic energy or whatever. So yeah, there's, there's a there's a radiation side to it, and yeah, yeah. there's an yeah there's an implosion and an explosion. As many people say at these conferences. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're good at tapping into the explosion side, it's a lot easier. The implosion side is much more difficult for people to tap into, or at least at the approach that they're taking. But the truth is, everything has to implode before it explodes. Now, as far as rotation and spin, I believe that this, uh, what we call these flux fields, flux magnetic fields, are at the source of, as I said before, time, motion, and vibration. So what's happening is that the linear pathway, the penetration, of this energy is deflecting matter. Where this energy is, matter cannot be. Okay, that's why there's a hole at the center. If you didn't have a hole, everything would be log jammed. Things wouldn't be able to move. It's because things aren't really based on a duality or a polarity like we think. It's always a trinary. There's always three parts of the system, and that three is the minimum that you can have to create a, a living, moving which are? system. What, what, which are the three? Well, uh, but numerically, we define them by the three, nine, and six. Though there are other fam, what we—that's how we define what we call family number groups, which I go into in a lot of my work. Um, there are three, nine, six, one, four, seven, and two, five, and eight. Uh, but essentially, the three, nine, six, which was referred to by Nikola Tesla famously, he said, I probably misquoted it a little bit, but something to the effect of, if humanity could understand the three, nine, and six, they would understand the secrets of the universe. Wow. And that's indeed what we found: is that the three, nine, and six are a separate system. They're not a physical, uh, they're not, they don't have physical mass. And so they, they are defining what is deflecting and causing everything to curve and warp back in on itself. And then eventually to explode and expand back out the other side. We can't hear you. He said, he said in and out in the center. Yeah, in and out in the center. Yeah, exactly. You could think of it that way. That there's there's always that there's always the 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 old, the zero or the nine. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, well, okay, sure. Yeah. Um, you were talking about uh, the points of three, six, and nine. Um, just curious uh, with the uh, the idea of shearing in these rotor coils, where you have uh, insulated copper touching themselves, and, and nodes and antinodes are canceling out, much like the uh, Nikola Tesla hairpin experiment he was doing in ultra high frequencies. That's yeah, great, great point. I didn't mention that uh, in the talk. I'll show you uh, some images. So, what we did, um, what he he asked about, he 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 used the word shearing. There was a term that's been coined within DDM. Uh, Marco coined it, called harmonic shearing. Okay. And it's not understood at all in terms of electrical engineering. These coils are very unique because we claim you can actually have two conductors side by side touching one another, and their resonance is so perfect that they won't short out. Okay? Because this thing is not all on at one time. Okay? It has a phasing, it has a sequencing. Okay? So when, when one circuit is on flowing in, the other ones are off. Then that one is off. And there's another path blowing outward, decompressing, and then they're both off, and that's when the flux field 
is active. What that does, and mathematically, uh, well, I, sh I shouldn't get too far into how it works numerically, but what we are able to see in these thick black lines here um, is what we call a harmonic shear, which means there's always a constant value there. And it means that uh, there's a boundary condition there. These underpinning nested vortices shear against one another. It's very important when you look at this image that the vortices do not line up. They are staggered, like the teeth of a shark, which, which is what makes it grip. It's what holds things together. And that is essentially what the etheron energy is. It is the glue that holds the universe together. And it creates these world boundary condition shears. And those shears create extreme amounts of power in a small space. Yes, sir. Has any importance to the size of the hole or the ratio of the hole and the center to the, uh, to the donut itself? Absolutely, yeah. How does that affect the, the effect of the, the water? Well, experimentally, we haven't fully determined that, so, but I'll tell you about it mathematically. It's very important, and, it's at, and, and you know, you're going to write to the advanced part of the map. Now, these are primitive hand-drawn hand -drawn images that are not precise geometrically. Um, even the ones that are out there on uh, the computer-generated images that we have now, uh, because, you know, uh, half the guys I've been working with for years here, this is the first time that we've met in person because there's no uh, funding apparatus around this project in that sense. Uh, I do know how to define that, and it depends on, it depends on the type of torus. The, the discovery that I made showed that there's an extreme amount of variation in this, which is what we wanted to find, because obviously going from a donut to all of this, there's a lot of variation involved. So really, the size of that hole can vary. And we see that in nature. You can have a hole, like in that cavitation bubble, that's roughly one-tenth the size of the outer diameter. Or you can have a, a, like a black hole type system, where it's uh, you know, a set trillionth or whatever, a tiny, tiny, tiny hole with a huge, huge outer radius. And I believe that that absolutely increases the power of the system. You know, when you're uh, talking to uh, the practical people out there who are trying to wind coils, though, they're not too keen on that tiny hole. So, um, so, but when we get into 3D printing, when we get into other types of engineering, that's going to become easier to do. And ultimately, I believe that is the key to hot fusion because it controls the temperature, it regulates it, and it concentrates it at the center, and it keeps the outside cool. So, um, probably have time for one more. So, Go. just what are your thoughts on Daniel Lunes' uh, observation of the powder that gets connected, collected? Do you have any thoughts on that since you mentioned that the temperature is so high on the inside? About the powder that gets yeah, collected? That, that he found you know, on the inside of his, of his coils that, that seems to collect that. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I don't specifically, but there there's so many interesting effects that we've seen out of these that, you know, and, and as advanced as this is, and this is, again, uh, very basic. I've gone so far into this mathematically as far as prime numbers, which I really wanted to talk about today, but there's just no time for it. Uh, there, there's so much advanced work in the math, and yet at the same time, we're barely even scratching the surface of what we know and understand about this. Our goal is to really create a community around this. I, I'll just say this one thing, and I'll take uh, this one last question, and then we'll probably have to wrap up. Um, we are uh, producing a film that we're going to be releasing online. Uh, it's called Randy's Donuts. I didn't give it that name, but uh, <laughs> there's a big joke around that. If you're, if you're from L.A., you know yeah, big Randy Donuts. Yeah, yeah. I rolled across the screen in the 2012 film, and everybody was real excited. And then Iron Man had his coil, and it was messed up. And I got so many emails like, you got to go see Iron Man. And so I went and saw it. And then he goes and sits in the Randy's Donuts, and everybody got a big kick out of that. So the film's called Randy's Donuts. Um, Actually, I believe today or tomorrow, this in the next couple days, is the last days we're going to have for the crowdfunding. But you guys can look that up online or, or check me out on Facebook, and, and all that uh, information is on there if you're interested in being a part. This project is like no other because we are a truly open source project. We are as destitute as you could possibly be. I'm not proud of it. It just is what it is. But um, it's because we're really committed, as my friend Michael here is as well, we're very committed to the operative word, which is free, energy. We're committed to the community, to the sharing. We're committed to doing something from the heart that's true and real and genuine, because that's the only way I believe that we can all come together, get over all the ego junk, and get together. Woo! Woo! Uh, I didn't have this one last year, and I
I'd be happy to take your two after if we're out of time. waiting for a while. Okay, yeah. go ahead. We'll do these two and then. Can I have time to do two? Okay, what is it? You said the 3D reality is a, 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 tri a trinary system and it, it maps the surface of the torus. Other dimensions of time and space, do they also map to the surface and are they also a trinary or something else? Yeah, that was what I was getting to in the, the point I was making earlier about string theory. You know, there's a lot of thoughts about different dimensions. I'm a little bit, uh, maybe I'm old school or whatever. I actually don't believe in all these extra dimensions. In fact, I don't believe that you can actually logically postulate something that you cannot conceive. You know, you can postulate something that you maybe haven't perceived, but you can conceive of it. But if you can't conceive of it, which no one has ever conceived of five dimensions, or, you know, they make these tesseracts and things, but they're all three dimensional. And, and, and the, the point is, you have 3D, and the higher dimension defined by the 396 is what we call the omni dimension. But it, 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 it is not in any way akin to, you know, it is, uh, it, it, it is non local in that sense. It, so you have 3D, which is physical reality, or any sort of, even if it's a, some, some people when they say dimensions, maybe they mean a higher frequency or something that's visible to us. Uh, but to me, that's still a part of a 3D reality. In any sort of bounded reality to me, the, the, the three, and this, I can get into the hardcore math arguments about why this is and why three is the sole unique prime number that defines why we use base 10, because it's the first true prime squared, which is nine, right, modular nine math. Uh, but, but essentially, yes, every, you have 3D, which is the physical world, and then you have the omni dimension, which is the energetic world. And that, that omni-dimension is only dimensionalized, per se, where it intersects with the third dimension. Uh, that's, yeah, I got it. Yeah. Just like TV and radio, it's all in the same space, just different frequency bands. Right, right. Okay, one last one. Uh, you brought up conventional plasma reactors, um, and I'm curious about your thoughts about uh, uh, the perceived enhancements that uh, BBM could could provide to current reactors and the changes and your thoughts on the changes. You said you're not an engineer yourself, uh, but just to compliment, you know, some ideas that you may have about enhancing current plasma reactors as the plasma is rotating the center of the torus inside the torus and current plasma reactors. Whereas we had, it seems like there's magic inside the center of the torus. Sure. So, well, it's somewhat similar, and I, obviously I'm not an expert on plasma reactors. For those of you who don't know. This isn't totally an obscure idea because toroidal reactors are all over the place. I mean, uh, there's a big, huge one up at the University of Wisconsin. There is uh, the tokamak, all these different types of toroidal fusion reactors. So this is something that uh, mainstream science is is somewhat onto, and uh, um, you know, but they're doing it similar to how things are done in, in uh, electrical engineering. You can make the analogy where they're using magnets to push the energy to push the plasma or to push the electricity uh, through the medium. So in, in the case of a coil, you're using the magnet to push it through the wire. And what we discovered in this, and what many people know, or uh, even if you do martial arts, pull is always stronger than push. No one likes to be pushed, you know. The pulling, the coercion side, is much stronger force. And uh, the ability to tap into that is largely uh, a matter of geometric the geometric pathway that it's moved in. So most of these fusion reactors, they get so hot so quick, I mean, they can only activate them for a very small uh, frame of time. And it's because they're using magnets moving vertically and horizontally to excite and move the plasma, and that's causing it to move in a way that creates a lot of friction, a lot of heat, a lot of heat loss. Okay? If you can move the, and I, I don't know how you would necessarily enhance the current design, but if you started Building, building off of these principles to begin with, moving the plasma along the pathway that it actually is seeking to go naturally will eliminate random collision. The particles will eliminate the friction and will concentrate the heat to the center and then regulate the temperature. And so this, this is the same essential <coughs> principle of how it would be used in that. Um, thank you all very much. I really appreciate it.